Hello and welcome to UGC e Pathshala. I am Dr. Swikar Lama, Assistant Professor in Criminology and Police Studies at Sardar Patel University of Police Security and Criminal Justice, Jodhpur. I am going to present the module on Nature and Forms of Organized Crime. The learning outcomes of this module are to make the learners understand the concept of organized crime, to make the learners understand various forms of organized crime, to acquaint the learners with the processes involved in organized crime. Organized crime is crime based on a cooperative effort like an organized business. Lynn Smith has defined it as crime that involves the cooperation of several persons or groups for its successful execution. According to Gordon Hawkins, organized crime involves association of a small group of criminals for the execution of a certain type of crime chalking out plans by which detection may be avoided, development of a fund of money for organizing criminal activities and providing protection to members, and maintaining political connections by means of which immunity may be acquired in case of detection. Thorsten Selin has described organized crimes as an enterprise organized for the purpose of making economic gain through illegal activities. Pickpocketing, robbery, burglary, smuggling, drug trafficking, prostitution, gambling are some of the crimes which involve association of a few criminals working as a team. The motive for committing these crimes is profit. Numerically, organized crime does not involve a large proportion of criminals, but for society it is considered to be a serious problem. Organized crime has certain important characteristics like teamwork, it involves association of a group of criminals which is relatively permanent and may even last decades. Hierarchical structure, it has a structure with grades of authority from the lowest to the highest involving a system of specifically defined relationship with mutual obligations and privileges. Planning, it involves advanced arrangements for successfully committing crimes, minimizing risks and ensuring safety and protection. Centralized authority, it functions on the basis of centralized control and authority which is vested either in the hands of one individual or a few members. Research fund, it maintains a reserve fund from profits which serves as capital for criminal enterprises seeking help of the police, lawyers and even politicians and for providing security to the arrested members and their families. Specialization. Some groups specialize in just one crime while some others may be simultaneously engaged in multiple crimes. Those groups which are engaged in multiple crimes are more powerful and influential. Division of labor. Organized crime involves delegation of duties and responsibilities and specialization of functions. Violence. It depends upon use of force and violence to commit crimes and to maintain internal discipline and restrain external competition. Monopoly. It has expensive and monopolistic tendencies. Initially, organized criminal gangs operate in a limited area and are engaged in a limited type of crime with a limited number of persons, but gradually they expand into a wider range of activities extended over large geographical areas involving a large number of carefully selected criminals. In whatever area they operate, they secure monopoly in the criminal enterprises. They do not hesitate to use violence or threats of violence to eliminate competition. Protective measures. It arranges permanent protection against interferences from law enforcement authorities and other agencies of the government. The protective measures include contacts with policemen, lawyers, doctors, politicians, judges and influential persons in society. Giving money in cash or in gifts, providing help in elections, threatening their competitors and arranging their influential persons' foreign trips are some of the methods used by these gangs to secure protection and avoid arrest and conviction. Conduct norms. It frames rules of conduct, policies of administration and methods of operation for members and for the operation of crime. This helps in maintaining discipline, efficiency, loyalty, obedience and mutual confidence. Penalties are imposed for violating rules. Now we will discuss about the various forms of organized crime. Organized crime has three major types of forms. First is gang criminality, racketeering and syndicate crime. 
The first has simple characteristics while the last one has a fully developed form because of which it is considered to be most dangerous to society. Let's talk about gang criminality. This type of criminality includes kidnapping, extortion, robbery, vehicle theft on a large scale. Gangs are composed of tough and hardened criminals who do not hesitate to kill, assault or use violence. They are equipped with modern pistols, bulletproof vests, cars, etc. The gang criminals are efficient, disciplined but dangerous. Barns and their activities are spread over a large geographical area, moving from place to place but reuniting at pre-arranged hideouts. They are registered as hardened and habitual criminals in police records. These criminals are recruited from among ex-convicts, escaped murderers, professional gangsters and high-powered robbers. There exist inter-rivalries among most of these gangs. Some of the gangs are also affiliated to the syndicates operating on a very large scale. Some gangs organize activities and brains to individuals and groups engaged in antisocial activities, taking a cut of the loot or a fixed amount of money for the help rendered. The gangs float a score of satellite including restaurants, gambling dens and underworld messengers. Women and children and hangers on from time to time these gangs are hunted down by the police and destroyed through most often the gangs operate with the active cooperation of the police. Occasionally the law enforcement officers arrest some members and even kill some others claiming the liquidation of an underworld empire. Now racketeering. This is a form of an organized criminal gang engaged in extortion of money from both legitimate and illegitimate business through intimidation of force. It also involves dishonest way of getting money by deceiving or cheating people, selling worthless goods and articles, adulterated commodities, spurious drugs and so forth. The racketeers, unlike organized criminal gangs, do not take away all the profits but allow the owners of the illegitimate business to continue their operations like prostitution, gambling, liquor, trafficking, drug peddling, etc. but give them regular fixed money. Sometimes businessmen engaged in fierce competition in legitimate business, employers and labor unions involved in conflicts, landlords unable to get their houses, shops vacated from tenants and politicians trying to eliminate their rivals hire the service of gangsters and seek their help by paying them their fees. In some cases, these racketeers refuse to leave and continue to extort fees from their former employers a favorite approach of these racketeers is to approach a businessman suggesting that they need protection and that it is could be furnished at a stipulated monthly fee. The businessman even if he does not need protection is forced to accept racketeer's suggestion. Once he starts paying the fee, he continues to pay till the racketeer's functions. The racketeers thus do nothing but live on the blood and labor of others collecting tribute by intimidation, force and terrorism. Assault and destruction of property often accompany the organization of the racket. Racketeering has found a fertile field in protecting restaurant owners and big shop owners from possible harm. By means of intimidation, racketeers are able to extort large sums of money from the proprietors. Failure on the part to subscribe to the protection plan results in the destruction of furniture, in the forcible taking away of goods and commodities, in the creation of nuisance by constantly sitting in restaurants or shops or in personal violence. Such demonstration of force by the protectors usually convinces proprietors and other businessmen that protection is worth the money demanded for it. According to Calwell, the racketeering gang is divided in two groups, the brains and the muscles. The former do the thinking, issue orders, solicit new business and arrange for protection. The later do the beating, destroying, plundering and even killing, all what is called the rough stuff. Fitzgerald has stated that sometimes the brains also do the jobs of the muscles to maintain their leadership, enforce their authority, demonstrate proper techniques to preserve their reputation. Now let us discuss about syndicate crime. This form of organized crime deals with furnishing illegal goods and services by an organized criminal gang often called mafia. The illegal goods could be drugs, liquor, etc. while the illegal services could be call girls, gambling and so forth. 
The syndicates create their own business procedures, usually operating from established headquarters. They avoid using violence, which differentiates them from organized criminal gangs, who frequently use violence or threat of violence. Society knows the members of these syndicates as respectable citizens living in posh residential areas, freely associating with high-status persons and engaged in lawful earning pursuits. The syndicates generally operate in big metropolitan areas, which happen to be big centers of communication, transportation and distribution of goods. The leaders of big crime syndicates periodically gather at fixed places to discuss problems of mutual interest and concern. Each syndicate has a boss and an underboss. The underboss collects information and relays messages to the boss and passes instructions down to underlings. In some cases, there is no underboss, but the boss has an advisor or a counselor. Below the level of the underboss and are criminals who act as intermediaries between the upper and lower level personnel. Some of the intermediaries act as chiefs of operating units. The lowest level members are ordinary criminals who report to the intermediaries. Outside the structure of the syndicate are a large number of employees and agents who do most of the actual work in various criminal enterprises. Now let us discuss about the rules of conduct in an organized crime. There is no evidence that various criminal organizations follow one particular code of behavior. Cresce has observed that no hard data is at all available on the law of criminal organization. Even if some groups have a code of conduct, it is unwritten. Yet on the basis of information collected from different criminal organizations, Cresce has suggested that the members of the organized gangs, rackets and syndicates generally work on the basis of the directives which are like the be loyal to the members of the organization, to maintain unity in the gang, do not interfere with each other's interests, do not be an informer, be rational and work as a team member, do the assigned work quietly, safely and in a profitable manner, Keep your eyes and ears open and your mouth shut. Be a man of honor and respect, womanhood and your elders. Don't engage in battles if you can't win. Now, Cresce points out that the conduct, code of conduct of organized criminals is similar to the codes adopted by prisoners, professional thieves and other groups whose activities and conditions of existence bring them into confrontation with official authority and generate the need for private government as a means of controlling the conduct of the members. Other authors have also made similar observations. Salerno and Tompkins have presented a more detailed code as the law governing what they call the crime confederation. Among the unwritten rules and directives are maintain secrecy, put the organization before the individual, consider other members' families sacred, reveal nothing to your wife, do no, not strike another member and do not disobey orders. While these two authors collected information from organized crime informants and police intelligence, Iani, a researcher, got information through participant observation of several groups and watching members' behavior. After observing, he sought regularities that had enough frequency to suggest that the behavior resulted from the pressures of shared social system rather than from idiosyncratic ideas and behavior. The three basic rules of behavior he found were primary royalty to the organization rather than to the individuals, doing nothing which brings disgrace on the organization and not reporting or discussing organization's matters outside the group. Some other codes which he found stressed were don't tell the police, don't cheat your partner in the network, don't be a coward and try to fit in your attitudes and actions with the group. The code adopted by any one criminal organization reflects far more than the mere fact that it is a secret association engaged in regular criminal activities. The factors which are likely to influence the conduct rules which are adopted and preserved are how and why the participants came together in the first place that is the bonding relationships or linkages, how long the organization has been operating, how small or big is the organization, the cultural heritage of its major participants and the nature and range of its activities.
Now, I will discuss about the survival mechanisms of permanent immunity of organized gangs. What is it that makes organized crime persist and survive? Five factors appear to be important in this context. Structural organization and role performance, public tolerance, code of conduct, nature of criminal law, and immunity measures. Structural organization and maintenance of secrecy by indulging in pseudo-legitimate activities and code of conduct have already been analyzed. Here we will focus on permanent immunity and public tolerance. The survival of the organized crime depends upon the fix. To put the fix in and maintain important connection with those in government and law organized crime groups typically have one or more members assigned to corrupt officials to maintain good relations with them. These members may be called corruptors. The corrupter may be found anywhere in the organization at hierarchy. His job is to bribe, buy, intimidate, negotiate and persuade policemen, public officials, politicians, judges, businessmen and anyone else who might help the organized crime group members to maintain immunity from arrest, prosecution and punishment. Cresce has called the political objective the nullification of government. According to him, this is sought at two levels. At the lower level are the agencies for law enforcement and the administration of justice, that is a policeman, a prosecutor, a magistrate or a licensed administrator. By giving bribes to these people, corrupter in the organized gang bracket or syndicate nullifies the law enforcement process. At the upper level are legislative agencies, central and state legislatures as well as municipal corporations. When a gang or boss supports a candidate for political office, he does so in an attempt to deprive honest citizens of their democratic voice, thus nullifying the democratic process. As such, nullifying law enforcement officers and legislatures is nullification of government, which acts as an important survival mechanism in organized crime. It could be said that permanent immunity is achieved by organized crime groups in several ways. Firstly, the leaders of the organized crime are not usually arrested and prosecuted because they stay behind the scenes of operation. Persons lower in the hierarchy, if arrested, are likely to be released by action taken by the superiors. Such release and avoidance of prosecution are assured through what is popularly known as the fix. Persons like policemen, judges, politicians, doctors, businessmen not directly involved in criminal activity contribute for various reasons to the protection of organized criminals. Protection is secured by gaining political power through contributions to political parties and political organizations, particularly for contesting elections and purchasing the support of members of the opposition. Many elected politicians thus owe the election to organized criminals. Regularly pay-offs to law enforcement officials also provide protection. A certain amount of immunity results from public toleration of organized crime since it provides the public with illicit and desired services such as alcohol, narcotics, call girls, and etc. Immunity is also provided by the functioning of law Sometimes there are such loopholes in the laws that lawyers manage to save their clients or criminals from legal action. Lack of effective legislation and weak law enforcement are reflection of official toleration of organized crime. Organized crime is able to evade law through infiltration in legitimate business. Sometimes organized crime and legitimate business may even mutually assist each other. Now, I'll talk about societal reaction, which is one of the most important reasons behind the existing of some of the forms of organized crime. Society supports or tolerates many types of organized crime indirectly. If not directly, it has been persuasively argued that organized crime is the result of the particular structure of our society. Donald Taft has said that the motives for organized crime are largely the same as those valued so highly in the free enterprise systems. Organized crime, like legitimate business, attempts to achieve maximum returns with a minimum of expenditure through efficient organization and skilled staff. The difference is that legitimate business operates within the law and organized crime operates outside the law. 
Lynn Smith has forcefully pointed out that factors like indifference to public affairs, general disregard for law, profit-motivated economics and questionable political practices produce a fertile place for organized crime. People in society also tolerate this crime because it gratifies many of their needs. The claim of the people and the law enforcement officials that they try to prohibit illegal practices is nothing but hypocrisy and self-deception. Robert Wetzel has described the coexistence of law and lawlessness as follows. Like the vast majority of people today would like to have the proverbial cake and eat it too by theoretically affirming values which they hold dear and at the same time reserving for themselves a certain leeway in realizing wishes which may not always correspond to these values. As a result, law and a high degree of lawlessness exist side by side and moralists and gangsters complement each other. It is this situation as well as the toleration of illegal services which act as a serious handicap in the control and prevention of organized crime. The public demands action sporadically as intermittent, sensationalized disclosures like sugar scandal, fodder scandal reveal corruption caused by organized crime. Without sustained public pressure, law enforcement officers and politicians have little incentive to address themselves to combating organized crime. So long political corruption exists in the country, which in India has now assumed scandalous proportions, a drive against organized crime will have no meaning. The vicious circle perpetuates itself. Corrupt politicians will not act unless the public so demands. The public will not insist for action till it gets the required services provided by organized crime and the police will not take prevention seriously till it gets its due share. Now to conclude, during the last six years of 90s or so, that is between 1993 and 1999, organized crime in Mumbai's underworld went through a significant change in several ways. Most gangs which survived for almost three decades on smuggling and extortion have now got involved in real estate rackets and thus has begun the builder gangster nexus. Gangsters of the underworld get slums cleared and help builders in getting possession of the disputed properties. It is estimated that one Don Bhai Thakur, who earlier operated under Daud but has now cut off all connections with him and surrendered to the police in early 1995, made over rupees 2000 crores by dealing in property. Gauli, Amar Naik, and Chota Rajan also were engaged in estate rackets running into crores. In fact, to a large extent, these gangsters today depend heavily on real estate for their growth and indeed survival. Further, after the communal riots in 1993, the underworld gangsters are now organized on communal lines. Organized crime will continue to persist till lawmakers enact laws rendering illegal any activities and products and services demanded by significant numbers of the population. Organized crime makes bulk of its profits through supplying illegal commodities and services. The public helps organized crime survive by demanding illegal products and services. Change in public behavior, attitudes and perception is not easy to achieve. The public officials to whom we look for protection and guidance themselves present a warped picture. Politicians perhaps believe that too much effort against exposing organized crime could be damaging to the future prospects. Given these numerous social, cultural, political and economic conditions, organized crime is there to stay, at least in the foreseeable future. Thank you.